Welcome to our very first live broadcast within the introduction to robotics MOOC. Uh, it's great to have a bunch of people participating in the event. I know the time zone isn't brilliantly convenient for everybody in the world. Uh, what we're going to do is to move these things around, have them uh, earlier in my day and later in my day. Right now, it's just about the middle of the day. Move them around so everybody has the ability to participate. Now, the particular format that we use means that the conversation is rather one-sided. It means that I can talk to you. You can't actually talk to me, unfortunately, but you can post comments. Uh, so you can post comments on this particular event, and you can also post comments into the discussion forum with the hashtag AskQT. Ask uh, what's, what's the hashtag? Uh, ask AskQT event. Oh, one. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it was posted. It was posted uh, on Monday of of this week. What is the right hashtag to use? And I should know that. So already we have some questions, and I will address those. But before we do that, I thought I might just share with you a bit of information about where all the participants in the MOOC come from. So I'm going to share uh, this screenshot with you. So this is a map of the world that shows where all the participants come from and the top 10 countries who are participating in the MOOC. So the biggest cohort of all comes from India, second biggest uh, from Australia, and then the United States, United Kingdom, Egypt, Canada, Malaysia, Germany, Philippines, and Bangladesh. The full list, there's something like 156 countries are, around the world have students participating in this particular MOOC. So I am pretty impressed that we've got such a such big coverage from countries all around the world. Let me stop that uh, stop that screen share. The other thing we know a little bit about the age distribution of people in the MOOC, and I think the oldest participant is age 70, and the youngest that we know about so far is age 10. Uh, so hopefully everybody is uh, doing okay with the MOOC content, uh, but I particularly for the youngsters, I think that they, they may struggle with increasing amounts of math that are going to happen from effectively from uh, week, week two onwards. But if it's too much maths at that point in your life, then hopefully you, know, you could sit the MOOC, take the MOOC again in a year or two's time and hopefully got some more maths, uh, math skills under your belt and be able to have a more enjoyable time the second time around. So I'm going to talk, address some of the questions that have been posted already. So George Sebastian asks me, what was, he asked a lot of questions actually, and one of them was, what was my first robot? Uh, the first robot uh, that I had anything to do with was when I was my first job at the University of Melbourne. And for an open day, uh, I bought a very cheap robot with stepper motors in it. I think it had five degrees of freedom, five joints and I programmed it to play a game of checkers or drafts. And uh, it, it, it did pretty well. So I had to program the draft, the logic for playing a game of, of checkers, and I also had to program a logic to move the joints to the right sort of angles. So that was an embarrassing, embarrassingly long time ago. It would have been 1982 or 1983. Uh, second question George asks is, did I sort of always know I was going to do electrical engineering? Yeah, absolutely, from probably age eight or something like that, I, I knew I wanted to do electrical engineering. So I, in those days, uh, again, embarrassing to admit, personal computers didn't exist, right? So if you're a kid in the, in the 70s, you kind of mucked around with radios and televisions and things like that. I didn't build my first computer uh, 8 bit microprocessor until something like 19, 1979, I think. Maybe it was maybe it was early now. It was certainly a long it was a long time ago. And absolutely from the outset I knew I wanted to be an electrical engineer. Uh, next question from George is can I share some of the project experiences I had? during 25 years when I was working at CSIRO. CSIRO is a big government funded research agency in Australia. And I did work there for <clears throat> pardon me, a very long period of time. I started off in a part of CSIRO that was concerned with 
uh, the manufacturing industry. So I first started looking at robots for uh, manufacturing applications. So picking items up off conveyor belts, uh, passing them to vision systems to be inspected and doing some, some assembly. Uh, and maybe I might post some pictures of that manu manufacturing cell that we created in the early in the early 1980s. A big part, a big part of my job at that time was trying to get robots to do tasks that require what we call compliant motion. And that is, if I've got a piece of metal that's got some burrs, some rough edges along it, what a human would do is they would move that across a across a grinding wheel in order to take the rough edges off. And the human has got some compliance, some softness in their arms. So it's, it's effectively that piece is being held by springs, which are the human's arms against the grinding wheel. Robots are much, much stiff. The arm of a robot is much stiffer than the arm of a human being. So if a robot grabs a piece with rough edges and moves it across a grinding wheel, and if there's any sort of slight positional error, then what you're going to do is just to remove a huge amount of material that perhaps you didn't intend to move, uh, didn't intend to remove. So what we were experimenting with at that time was what's called compliant motion control. So the robot was reacting to forces that were applied to the object that it's holding and the positions of all the robot joints adapt in real time according to the force. So we could specify to this robot, hold it against the grinding wheel and apply a force of 10 newtons against the grinding wheel and then move the piece across the grinding wheel. So it's what we call compliant motion control. And that was really my first serious foray into, into robotics. After that, I moved from Melbourne to, to Brisbane to be involved in applying robotic technology to the mining industry. In Australia, the mining industry is really, really big. So we were trying to apply those techniques to the control of big mining machines. And I've actually got a picture of one of those big sort of mining machines that I used to I used to play with. Let me do the screen share thing again. Start the screen share. So the machine that I spent the most amount of time dealing with is this one here. We call it a drag line excavator. It's a massive machine. Uh, from here up to here is maybe 100 meters. This bucket holds 100 to 150 tons of dirt at a time and the whole machine weighs three to 5,000 tons. They're massive machines. And what we were trying to do is to turn it into a robot. So this is the end effector of this robot. We wanted to be able to put it onto the ground at a known location, pull it through the dirt and then lift the bucket up and then the whole machine swings on its base and dumps the dirt. And uh, then it puts the bucket back down on the ground and does it all over again. So this machine moves about one bucket full of dirt every minute, 150 tons of dirt every minute and machines like this are capable of performing huge amounts of excavation in the mining industry. So then after that project we got involved with self-driving trucks for underground underground mining operations so the vehicles that carry ore through underground mines automating those uh, and then I did, got into environmental robotics built underwater robots started to build flying robots initially with helicopters and we later we moved into quadcopters or quad, quad rotors and then around 2010 I decided it'd be good to come to university I was getting interested in teaching I wanted to write a book all sorts of things like that so that's where I've been since 2010. <clears throat> George's question number five is have I experienced any spectacular robot failures uh, not particularly spectacular uh, we've had some self-driving robots that crashed into things uh, it's kind of amusing at the time. Uh, it's interesting to interesting to watch. Uh, I was involved once in a demonstration of a self of a of a fl of a flying robot, a robotic helicopter, and in front of a lot of uh, invited guests and and politicians, uh, we crashed that into the ground in a sports stadium in Brisbane. Uh, it did, there was no flames, there was no fire, uh, but it was pretty embarrassing. And that's probably it really for uh, robot failures. Uh, that one was certainly very, very, very public. Uh, George's final question is, what's my recommendation for courses for students who are interested in a career in robotics? 
but I think this has got to depend on whereabouts you are in the world, uh, what universities you've got access to, and then what robotics courses they have. At many universities, robotics actually is taught in a degree often known as mechatronics. So mechatronics is a discipline which is a fusion of mechanical engineering, electronics, and, compu and computer science uh, software. That's what mechatronic systems are. They're systems that got a mechanical component, electronic component, and a software component. So look for look at your local universities and look for mechatronics courses. You're likely to find that. Uh, you, you're more likely to find a mechatronics course than a robotics course. But within a mechatronics course, you may well find particular units uh, that are concerned with robotics. And that's certainly how it is at my university. Queensland University of Technology, I teach into a mechatronics major, uh, but we have you know, at least two units, introduction to robotics and advanced robotics that we teach to those mechatronics students. Okay, if you're interested in getting a question to me, then please post a comment on the discussion forum or post a comment onto this particular event. Next. Next question is from Jeremy Walker, and he is an aspiring roboticist, which is good. I think lots of aspiring roboticists in the course, which is a total delight to me. Uh, and wondering whether I had some sci-fi influences that uh, that caused me to move into, into robotics. Uh, and I think he had observed some of the robots in my bookshelf that you've seen in perhaps some of the uh, some of the pieces of the MOOC that were shot here in my in my office. Uh, absolutely. I grew up in the in the 1960s, and there were lots of robot imagery uh, on on TV. Some, yeah, my favourite uh, TV robots. Jaime the robot from Get Smart still makes me laugh. Uh, there were the Jetsons. There was Lost in Space, and so on. Uh, and the images of a lot of these robots, I really wanted to include in the MOOC, but for various sorts of copyright reasons, I'm not able to to do that. I think the thing that was probably the most influential to me is this book. And this book was published in 1964. And my parents must have given it to me. This is the book that I got uh, when I was a kid. And I can't remember how old I was when I got it, uh, probably five or six or something like that. And it's the How and Why Wonder Book of Robots and Electronic Brains. And my mum found it again recently uh, when she was cleaning up the house and she gave it back to me. And there were all these wonderful images in here that I can remember from when I was a kid. Let me see if I can find one of my favourite ones. Uh, it's a really well-written book. So yeah, this is the, the image that uh, I is kind of burned into my memory from when I was a kid. It's a picture of the Mobot. So this is a robot that's strong enough to bend iron bars, but also gentle enough to uh, to manipulate uh, chemi chemistry flasks. Uh, so this is a pretty advanced robot for the time. And I actually tried to do a bit of Googling to find out more about the, the Mobot, uh, but I really couldn't couldn't find much about it. And this is the other picture that I remember from when I was a kid of a uh, of a robot, uh, an underwater robot that's doing some doing some welding. So yeah, books like give a book like this to a kid and it can be uh, it can be very influential. Uh, you never know uh, what what's going to what's going to happen to them in their in their life and turned out to be a professor of robotics. Uh, would never have guessed that at the time. So the question about my expectations from science fiction influences to the reality of the field today, you know, there were all sorts of influences uh, on somebody growing up in the 1960s. It was a time of fantastic enthusiasm about science and technology, which really hasn't transpired. So in the 60s, you know, we were reading about the fact that there were going to be space stations orbiting the Earth and people would be able to go up there for visits and there'd be bases on the moon and all these sorts of things. And it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I think the same with robots. We've seen portrayals of robots that were very capable, uh, very highly functional. And the robots we build today are still far short of that. And it is, it is a frustration. Uh, there's probably a lot of reasons why robots are not perhaps as advanced as, as we would like them to be. Robots are very complex systems uh, that you need uh, to, to, for a really functional, capable robot. We've got to have a really good mechanism. The machine has got to be, it's got to be excellent, it's got to be good electronics and good software. 
And software is perhaps one of the, the limiting factors in, in robots. Uh, modern robot systems got a lot of software in it. Getting that software right is very, very difficult. And then the problems of how does the robot actually perceive its world? How does it see what's around it so that it can react to it? And, and that's a problem, it's still a cutting edge research problem is how do we cr create a machine whose input of cameras which are observing the world and use that information to figure out what's happening, what's, what's around me and how do I move in order to accomplish some sort of goal or some sort of task. So it's a cutting edge problem in artificial intelligence and computer vision. And until we solve these fundamental research or scientific problems, we're not going to be able to build robots like we would like to be able to build. So it's still cutting edge research. Uh, that's what's holding us up. And yeah, I'm frustrated about this, but at the moment there is some really amazing work happening, particularly in what's called deep neural networks. Uh, systems where we can actually train computer systems with lots of examples of things and they learn, they can make really good generalizations. And I think this, I feel very positive, this is going to be perhaps the breakthrough uh, that's going to allow us to create the robots that we want to create. Uh, Jeremy's final question is, what surprised me in a positive way about the difference between uh, the science fiction expectation and, uh, and the reality? Look, I think there's been some fantastic uh, achievements in the field of robotics, even if we can't build something like C3, C3PO, something intelligent like that. You look at industrial robots. It's a technology that's more than 50 years old and responsible for building all manner of uh, items that we buy. You know, most cars are built primarily by robots. Uh, Electrical, electronic devices, computers, laptops, tablets, phones, most of these are all built by, by robots. So these robots are not much seen, but they are, they touch many, many of the things that we, that we buy, that we own. You look at how Amazon operates, most of their big dispatching centers, robots play a really big role in getting the products from an Amazon warehouse into a box, which is shipped to your particular house. So these are, fantastic achievements, but as I said before, mostly by robots that are not too much in the public view. And finally, you have to say va robot vacuum cleaners. You know, it's a technology that's probably just over 10 years old now, and there's getting them towards 20 million of them on the planet. So, you know, that's a fantastic achievement in just 10 years to create 20 million robots that do a pretty useful job, and many ordinary people who are not trained in robotics can use them and they perform a useful task uh, around the house. So uh, that's my, my answer to Jeremy, Jeremy's question. Next question on notice that I have is from Colin Love. And this is more of a technical question and he is asking about Euler angles and Cardan angles, which are what we talked about in lecture number three. And he says, why would we prefer Euler angles uh, to Cardan angles? And if you remember from the lecture, Euler angles are where we describe the orientation of a body, and I'll make a coordinate frame with my, with my hand here. We describe the orientation of the body by a rotation, perhaps around the z-axis, then around the y-axis, and then around the z-axis. Where a cut an angle, something like roll pitch your angles, we rotate about x, then y, then z. We rotate about three different axes with Euler, axles, Euler angles. We rotate using just two axes. One of the axes is uh, is replicated. Uh, look, it's whatever and three angle convention you use, you are going to be able to describe the orientation of of a body. The Z Y X or X Y Z roll pitch your angles, I think, make a lot of intuitive sense, particularly when you think about it in the context of of a of a vehicle or of a of a of an object in three in three dimensional space. Uh, so, you know, the roll angle is, uh, if this is my hand is an aircraft, roll angle is rotation around this. It makes intuitive sense. If you're an aeroplane, you know, the vehicle has to roll in order to turn. Pitching, if an aeroplane, I'm going up or I'm going down, that intuitively makes a lot of sense. And then this is yawing. So to me, roll pitch yawing angles make a lot of intuitive sense. It's easy to understand how the body is moving. Uh, Euler angles, I generally need to use the computer to visualize the, the Euler angle motion. 
So my preference is for roll pitch your angles and roll pitch your angles is almost in the common vernacular. Uh, in lay people, I think, would understand what roll pitch your angles are. Euler angles, that's absolutely not the case. So, uh, so they're all equivalent. They all do the job. Uh, some are perhaps more intuitive than, than others. Uh, that's really all the guidance that, that I can offer on that. Next question that I have on my list is from Chris Sykes, and he's asking a question about MATLAB gradings. Okay, so in the first week we had a bit of a bit of grief with grading the MATLAB assignments. This is a part of the of the MOOC technology that I was pretty excited about that we can actually create assignments where you get to express what you've learned in terms of MATLAB code that you that you write. To me, this was a really a really great feature. I'm really excited about it. What's happened in some of those first assignments is you've written code which gives the correct answer. But the grading script, that's the software that I wrote, uh, also computes, I compute what I think should be the right answer and I compare it with your answer and then I say you've passed or you've failed. So the problem's in my code. And what happens is sometimes if you do numerical calculations in a slightly different order, you can get very slight differences in the double precision numbers uh, that represent the quantities. And these numbers are tiny. The numbers are you're different by about 10 to the minus 16. Number errors in the 16th decimal place. And my code was not taking that into consideration. And so therefore, answers which you computed, which were correct, I was grading them as fail. And that's wrong, right? So my code did the wrong thing. So we've fixed uh, all the instances where these comparisons happen and we've made it now a, a fuzzy comparison. So as long as your answer and my answer are correct to within some precision, I think it's like six or eight decimal places now, then I will grade you as correct. Now, some people unfortunately used up their five submissions uh, in before they discovered that the problem was with me and not with you. So what we've done is for all the people who are affected, we have reset your submission count. So if you go back to that particular uh, page in the course website, hopefully your solution will still be there, uh, resubmit it, and it should be graded correctly. So that's all I have to say about that. I apologize profusely for grading your correct answers wrongly. Uh, that's not a nice thing to do. Uh, and we've taken some learnings from this. Uh, remember that this is the first MOOC that, we, that we've done. Uh, so all that we've learned from that we've applied to weeks two and beyond and into the, the following MOOC, which is called which is called Robotic Vision. So they are all the questions that I have on notice. So maybe I'm gonna grab Obadiah. He can come in and perhaps give me some new questions. Uh, here he is. So many of you will have met Obadiah in the forums. I'm gonna move back, back here a little bit. Hello. Welcome Obadiah. So Anthony Keller asks, what robot job opportunities are there in Brisbane uh, or what robot opportunities are there in general? Uh, Brisbane's a city where, where we are based. And to be frank, I'm not sure there are very many robot job opportunities in, in Brisbane. Do you know of any robot job opportunities in Brisbane? Not at the moment. Yeah, apart from this university. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so no, at this point, at this point not. In general, though, I think it's quite an interesting question. Robotics is starting to become a, a big business, although the field of robotics is old. You know, it's 50, 60, 60 years old. In the last few years, I've sensed a real excitement in, in robotics and a whole bunch of startup robotic companies are starting to happen. So people are, take, are now starting to take the ideas, the concepts, the, the theoretical underpinnings of robotics and apply it to robots that do you know, novel, unusual, and really cool functions. Robot startups are happening, and some of those robot startups are being bought by bigger companies. So famously last year, if Google bought eight or 10, uh, I've lost count, small robot companies. Uh, some of them not that small. Boston Dynamics, for instance, the people who make Big Dog and, and Cheetah and, and so on, you know, they've been bought by, by Google. Bot and Dolly, people who make, uh, make robots, which are used in filmmaking, uh, have been bought by Google. So I think now we're seeing people are, uh, are finding an opportunity, something where robots would make sense, 
there's enough knowledge, there's enough technology out there now to be able to build robots in a relatively straightforward way. Two guys in a garage can build a robot now where perhaps 10 years ago you needed to be a university research lab. The technology has become much, much more accessible. And so I think globally there are going to be more and more robot businesses uh, being created, starting up, and they're going to need people who understand the fundamentals of robotics. Uh, and probably the biggest skill that, uh, that robotics companies are going to need is skills in software. I think now when we engineer a robot, we can buy pretty good motors and gearboxes and mechanical bits. You need a good mechanical designer. Yes, somebody you need to know about electronics. Most electronics now you can buy off the shelf. Uh, the challenge now in building a robot system is primarily in software. So if you want to get into robotics, absolutely, you've got to be a master of software. So you need to understand about how to program in modern object-oriented languages, C++, Java, Python, or whatever. Uh, we use MATLAB in the course because it's got a number of advantages. Uh, particularly, we think it's easy for a lot of people to set up on their on their computers. So we're all using the same language inside the same programming environment. But most real-world robots will be programmed in C++, Java, or Python. All right. So, Vita, you've already talked a little bit about this with the deep neural networks. Yeah. Uh, and Hari Prasad here asks a question about choosing a thesis topic. So perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on what you think are hot topics in robotics right now, but maybe more some general advice about choosing a thesis topic. And this is at PhD level? Uh, masters at the moment, I believe, but maybe yeah. maybe for both. To my mind, the, the biggest problem in, the biggest problem, the biggest challenge in robotics still remains perception, right? So we can build a competent machine, but in order for the machine to do a useful task, it needs to be able to understand the state of the world. And this is something that I mentioned before, and it's kind of my hobby horse, so I'm gonna bang on about it. But really, a, a robot without perception, I mean, it's functionally equivalent to a human being who cannot see. And, you know, somebody who cannot see, it's a, it's a very severe disability to have. It really limits what they can do. If we could get robots to see, they have all sorts of advantages in understanding the world that's around them. So I think any sort of research topic that's around perception, and that could be, could be visual perception, uh, there has been... And people have been working on this for many, many decades. But we still haven't yet cracked it. But there are many other modes of robot perception as well, which are important. I think uh, audible perception is also important to understand who is speaking, where are they with respect to with respect to the robot, and what are they saying. I think if we have robots working alongside us in the future, and that's my dream, dream. That's what I'm pretty sure will happen. It's what I'd like to see happen. And we want to be able to communicate with these robots in a very natural way. We like to be able to talk to them and have them understand it. If we had to type everything into a keyboard, I think we'd get very frustrated with our robot co-workers. So we'd like to be able to talk to them. We'd like to be able to point uh, at things. Uh, we'd like to be able to you know, pick things up and, and show it to the robot. And it would understand, grasp what we're on about, and, and then go off and do the task. So visual perception, audible perception, uh, speech recognition, and so on. The other one is tactile perception, and we do this a lot. We use our eyes to guide our hands roughly, uh, say to pick up, a, pick up a cup here. I use my eyes to guide my hand roughly in the direction of the cup. And then my fingers curl and I just naturally pick the cup up. So this, what we call tactile perception, is also critically, critically important. So looking for a thesis topic, there is a lot of work still to be done in robot perception. And there's lots of different flavors of robot perception. So I think that'd be worth a look. So you, Peter, you mentioned about this this dream, this vision of having robots work beside and alongside us. Mm -hmm. What's the current state of robot ethics in terms of uh, endangering humans or, or uh, to avoid something like a, a Terminator scenario, perhaps? Do you have any insight into that? Okay, so there's a couple of there's a couple of things there. Uh, once upon a time, the industrial robots, first generation industrial robots, are sort of things that build cars and and build and build computers and build electronics had to be kept in, kept isolated, oftentimes in steel cages with, uh, with safety barriers. So because these machines are incredibly fast and incredibly strong, and if a human being strayed into their path, the human being would be hurt. And so there were safety regulations around these robots. They needed to be isolated from humans. And you know, people have been hurt uh, and people have been killed by these industrial robots. 
problem comes back to the fact that they've got no perception. They can't see what's going on. They simply blindly move their hand from one coordinate to another coordinate. And if there's a soft human being in the way, well, that soft human being is going to get hurt. So that's that's great for many, many decades when we wanted to build, uh, build car factories. We put cages around the robots and kept the human beings off the factory floor. Easy. But if we want robots to be to work amongst us, then we need to have human safe robots. And so this is another whole big and, and growing research area. What do we do about that? Some of you might have heard about a robot called Baxter, uh, made by a company called Rethink Robotics. Baxter's been out for about a year and a half now. And it's a human safe robot. And we have one in our, in our lab. And it's got two arms and a torso. And if you, if the arm touches you, it will sense that it's touched you and it will, it will stop or adapt its motion. It certainly won't cause you any harm. And Rodney Brooks, who's uh, a very famous roboticist, actually an Australian, uh, I visited him at Rethink Robotics and, and Rod actually was a, a Baxter robot doing some stuff uh, in the, in their lab. And Rod actually put his head in there and, uh, it's a pretty impressive head. Uh, he put his head in there and the robot came up and touched the side of his head and stopped moving. So, you know, Rod has, uh, has confidence in, in the product, which is good. All roboticists should have confidence in, in what they build. So this is a new generation. These are robots that are human safe. Now, this is not a mobile robot. This is a robot that's fixed to the floor. But if a human comes in contact with its arms, it will stop and do the right thing. We're going to move to mobile robots uh, in the future. These are things that are on wheels move around, perhaps they've got arms as well, and they're going to have to have all sorts of sensors that can detect contact with human beings and, and adapt themselves accordingly. Now, the second part of your question was about ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, and remind me the, the ethics part. So what's the current state of dealing with robots? Are there any uh, ethics laws or any, any ethics committees that are happening right now? Or is there, are there any plans for that in the future? So robots and ethics is an interesting a really, really interesting topic. And I think it's not something that the robotic community talks enough about. In the in lecture 12 of this particular course, it's really all about, about robots and ethics. So it's a conversation that we will have. I'm not an ethicist. I'm a roboticist. I like to build machines and, and, and write code. So in that lecture, I talk with a colleague of mine, Doug Baker, who's another engineer, and he knows a lot more about ethics than I do. So in that lecture, we have quite a conversation, Doug and I, about robot ethics. But the ethical questions that we do talk about in that lecture are self-driving cars. So there's a lot of press about, about Google, Google self-driving car. Self-driving car is really a robot that carries a human being from one place to another, moves a human from A to B. Uh, and there are questions around that, like let's say the, the robot car is has an accident uh, and injures the person that's carrying or it runs over somebody a pedestrian uh, by, by mistake and the designers of the car are doing their utmost to stop that from happening but what if it did happen then whose fault is that uh, and are we comfortable as a society with creating machines that you know, might occasionally malfunction and kill people that's an interesting question i mean right now the cars that we have which are driven by human beings kill about 1.2 million people every year on, on planet Earth, uh, and probably 100 times that number are injured. So if we have robot cars, which maybe kill or injure a, a few people, that's pretty sad. But the current situation we have is completely stupid, having machines that kill a million people a year. So it would be an improvement. But I think there's still some, some interesting ethical, legal, insurance, uh, questions that as societies we, we need to wrestle with. Another one is robots in warfare. And there's been a lot of push by uh, militaries around the world to have uh, robot soldiers, uh, robot vehicles, uh, robot snipers, uh, flying robots, unmanned aerial vehicles, which can fire, fire weapons and, and kill people. At the moment, these robots are partly autonomous. The decision to fire a weapon is generally still made by a remote human being. So imagery from the robot goes to a human being and they make the decision to fire, the robot does the deed. Uh, but there is a push to make that fully autonomous. So the robot is making the decision to fire. And to me, that's unsettling. I, I don't think that's right. So I think there's a big conversation we had there. A few other ones, I, I think if you're looking at the increasingly 
elderly population that we have in most countries on earth now, we can have robots to help those elderly people. But is that right, just to delegate the care of, of our parents and, and elders to, to a robot, to a machine? Uh, it might be convenient for us to, uh, to have a robot look after an elderly uh, and perhaps uh, frustrating relative, but is it the right thing to do? And the same with the other end of the spectrum, is it okay to have robots rearing children? If we don't have enough childcare workers in our, in our country, should we outsource that task to robot? So lots of really good questions. I don't have answers. Uh, there are questions and we can have discussion and conversation about them. And it should be a really wide, broad conversation. Everybody should be involved in this, not just roboticists. The general public should be involved. And that's something that I think all roboticists should, uh, should be more active about. That was a long answer to a, a very short question. Well, it's a good answer. I look forward to hearing more in that lecture in uh, lecture twelve you mentioned, which comes up in uh, yeah the end of end of comes up in week six. Yeah. All right. Well, we've had lots of really great questions on the forum, so we're probably only got time for one more. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to bring it back full circle here. Charles asks about the the reason behind doing this MOOC. What's your driving motivation for actually putting this together? It's, it's a good question, and it's one that I ask myself sometimes. The, the MOOC's probably taken me uh, somewhere, be, somewhere between 18 months and, and two years to, to create. Uh, one answer is because I could, uh, and it's something that the idea of it's grown on me over, over time. Once upon a time, I created these robot toolboxes, which uh, you will be using in, in the MOOC, and you know, that was some software that I wrote out of my PhD thesis and maintained in my spare time. It's got a huge following. People use it all around the world for, for teaching for teaching robotics. So it's great that I could create a tool that other people could use to teach their students about robotics. Uh, but I was kind of you know beyond arm's length. You know, I was just the guy who wrote the tool and other teachers would use it to teach their students. And I had some ideas about what's important when you teach robotics and what's not important when you teach robotics. And you know, I'm not talking to the students, right? It's other people are talking to the students. So I thought, oh, okay, how do I get closer to students? So I wrote a book uh, and the book was a lot of fun to write. And it really is my view of what's important in robotics and how it should be and how it should be taught. So now I'm getting a bit closer to the students, right? They read my book, they read my words, they see my diagrams and I'm explaining the things that I would explain it to them if I was having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with those students. But it's still a bit indirect, right? And it's still, they have to read the words and there's probably, they're still going to lectures and maybe the, the teacher is, re, is taking stuff from my book, interpreting it and presenting it back to the students. So it's still not me talking directly to the students. Uh, so, but the book is closer. And so then the MOOC really is an opportunity then for me to get more, more close to the students. It's still, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but it's a one-way one-on-one conversation, which is which is unfortunate. But it's the best you can do with a class which is now almost twelve thousand students. Uh, and I pinch myself sometimes to uh, believe that it's it's that many students all around the world. So the MOOC is really an opportunity for me to explain things to you the way I would do if I was trying to explain it to Obadiah in, in my office. So I'd use the same arguments, I'd use the same models and props, and 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 so on. Uh, and so that's really that's really what I what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to explain robotics to people in my way because I, I think there are if you look at other other textbooks and other robotics courses, I think there's information in there in those other courses that perhaps isn't isn't so important. A lot of these other courses use an awful lot of math, and it's important. You need to understand the maths, but I think. If you front load with mathematics, I think you tend to make the content inaccessible. So what I try to do is to use as little mathematics as possible. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a ma particularly mathematical person. Uh, you know, I'm an electrical engineer who you know, learned, learned programming along the way and enough maths to get by. So in this MOOC, what I'm trying to do is to provide you with uh, the clearest possible understanding of quite complex concepts with the smallest amount of maths, and when we do need the maths, uh, try and try and introduce it to you in a way that that's not too scary. I think probably all around the world, a mathematical education is probably not as rigorous as it as it once was. Uh, and I think you know the students coming into university, I think they don't seem to be as well prepared mathematically as perhaps we were 
I was in, in my day. It's something that academics, I think, always complain about. Students don't know enough maths. Uh, and I think they do know enough maths, but I think we just need to be careful about how much, about using just enough maths, no more, to get these arguments across. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we, all the questions we have time for. I uh, want to thank everyone for joining in today. Absolutely. Uh, pleasure to have you have you with us. Uh, I hope it adds some value. We will do another one of these, and uh, hopefully one every week, and we'll move the time around uh, so that people uh, in different time zones can uh, can participate. I know people in the UK and, and Europe, uh, it's probably not a very very convenient time for, for you and we'll, uh, we'll do better for you for you next time. Uh, please post any comments uh, about this format, whether you found it was, was useful, not useful, what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, post this in the discussion forum so we can adapt the format uh, to something that's uh, more useful to you next time around. All right, look All forward right. to next time. All right, thanks very much, people. Bye. Bye.